Mel Chaskin, have the honor of being the chairman of the board of the center. Um, and uh, we've done a lot to look around and have a over at Joanne Stargis in 1983. And of course, so this, this October we'll be celebrating our 40th anniversary. Announcement and welcome everybody. You can see your agenda. The center has grown from just the program that the Admiral Joy started with the RSI to the USB Olympics participation that we sponsor, the teacher exchange program, training teachers in the United States, how to teach STEM and STEM students, the license program, which is again for not just the teachers, but also teaching better knowledge of what STEM is and the importance of STEM. And with that information, I would like now to introduce Joey York.
We are so pleased that over these this many years, I've negotiated bilateral agreements with 58 countries. And we were the first to have students from the Balkan nations, the first to have students from China. We began the program, a research science initiative in Bulgaria, in Saudi Arabia, in Singapore, in Israel, and, and that, we believe, is the gift we can give from our nation to improve and increase peaceful relations. All offered free of cost because of donors like yourself and corporations and organizations. This year, we begin an outreach program to identify underrepresented populations to be identified and applied to our Research Science Institute and our USA Biology Olympiad. We have a board committee and we have two um, members of our staff who are working on this. And in just this year, we increased from two underrepresented in our programs to eight or 12. We're so proud, and without lowering any standard, without any special considerations, every ethnic population has terrifically gifted students. It's just a matter of identifying them and getting them in our programs. <coughs> we have a teacher enrichment program and a lyceums program for teachers and students from under-resourced schools. And those programs are in 12 states. They're doing so well. We make use of volunteers, many of you here, to speak at these programs, to contribute experiments for the teachers to use in the classes, and to give unique presentations, videos, panel discussions, and we have one coming up that Anne Jim has put together uh, with our board member, Kathy Sherman, which will talk about getting a drug to market, which is <coughs> under misunderstood by the public. RSI, and we have alums here. MIT agreed to go to 100 students this year. We cap it at 100, and we are so excited we have with us two of the nations that have been with us the longest time. Bulgaria has sent students to this program through the Cyril and Methodius sponsorship for 31 years. Lebanon, and Mrs. Benedi Hariri is an honorary member of our board, has had students in our program for 30 years. And this year, for the first time, we welcome students from the Philippines. So, the RSI is reputed to be the most rigorous research program in the world, and students, I mean, nations stand in line to get their students into the program. It's so happy, you know, I was telling someone, they said, wouldn't Ethel Rickover be proud? And I said, maybe, but if you knew Ethel Rickover, he finds to be improved. And every day I look up and he's usually bellering at me about something. But we're so proud of our programs and the advancements of the RSI. And I see Senator Lieberman has come in and we're so proud to give this award on his behalf. I would like to introduce to you our four ambassadors who are with us today. His Excellency Georgi Pereyotov, Ambassador of the Republic of Bulgaria. His Excellency <laughs> Ambassador of the Republic of Kazakhstan. I didn't see him come in yet. Okay. His Excellency Jose Manuel Romuald Vince, Ambassador of the Republic of the Philippines.
Excellency, Wen Yok Dong, I think he had something that just came up from the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. So those are ambassadors. This that I'm going to have um, my executive assistant stand here as represent their representatives from other nations who have students who will be at RSI. And he has the listing of the students who will be coming from each nation. So I will have him give them out to present them to the ambassadors and then give them to the designees. With that, I also would like to introduce standing in for our Board of Trustees. Kathy Sherman was going to arrive a little late from <coughs> Jim. Mark Cantorwitz, who is with us on the board, and of course the Chairman of our Board of Trustees, Mel Chaskin, and myself. At the head table, I'd like to introduce our terrific honoree, Dr. Aaron Kesselheim, and his father and mother, Tina and Howard, and his brother, who is also a graduate of the RSI, Jared. We have It's getting harder and harder to identify and have with us some of the original staff of the late Admiral Recover. But we have Captain Mario Fiore, who helped us get our first. <laughs> Dr. Ellen Bogan get in yet? Okay. Then um, there is one other gentleman I would like to introduce who has helped us tremendously over the years with our scholars and we sponsor several students each year as Department of Defense Scholars. John Wilkelson. Where is John? Is he not here yet? He's never missed one and he told me he would be <coughs> And without the Rickoids and my great staff, this couldn't have happened today. It's going to be a wonderful day. We're excited to get to host it for you. Himself is a physician, a surgeon, so he gets it. He knows the STEM world. I'm so proud to present Dr. Dr. Neil Dunn, Congressman Neil Dunn. Good afternoon. It's a real honor to be here with such an intelligent and accomplished group of people. Uh, obviously, I have an interest in STEM education. I didn't know Dr. Eric's background before. I met him just a few minutes ago, uh, Dr. Kesselman here. And, uh, and it turns out that he and I have the same interest in uh, drugs and manufacturing, pricing, distribution. So, you know, I'm just going to use it for, uh, for a, uh, a ten a weeks uh, in our hearing here when it's coming up. So, thank you. It's a great opportunity to see people. Senator Lee, it's been too long since we've seen each other in person. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we really need to get together more. Uh, STEM education really is important. We look around the world, we see the need for engineers and mathematicians and biotechnologists of all types. So we, it's up to us to really encourage those education because we need those people in our societies all of them, all around the world. And you see the many, many nations represented here. It's important to all of us to, to push that STEM. It's funny, I was always pushing STEM when I was a surgeon in practice, be judging science very and whatnot. And uh, then when I ran for office, I said, gosh, you gotta teach history too. <laughs> They've forgotten a lot of real history, but uh, you know, it's all part of having an outstanding education. Uh, and I'm really, really pleased to be associated with the Center for Excellence in Education. It's a, it's a special honor to be here with you. Anything that we can do going forward to make this effort better, we absolutely, my office will lean in and help. Uh, I am uh, humbled by the type of minds that I'm surrounded by here. 
So I'm not going to try to teach you anything, but uh, I will say that I'm, I'll be a great cheerleader for you. Senator Todd Young from Indiana. I apologize that I can't be with you in person today, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to share a few words as an honorary trustee of the Center for Excellence in Education. I applaud the work CEE is doing to advance STEM education in America by preparing our STEM educators and providing opportunities for students. As you know, STEM education equips students with hands-on experiences, and the skills needed to excel in high-level jobs. STEM education is also critical to the next generation of American scientific innovation. Right now, though, our nation is behind in STEM education, and we're losing to a country that doesn't share our values. The Chinese Communist Party is producing four times the number of STEM graduates as we are here in the United States. And the CCP's universities are regularly outranking ours in certain fields. We can't let this be the narrative of the 21st century. Last year, landmark legislation I helped author, the Chips and Science Act, became law. This new law is a bold investment in our economic and national security and will also ensure America's leadership role in science and technology by investing in the future. One key aspect of this law is investment in basic scientific research and the significant expansion of STEM education in America. By increasing investment in STEM education, we will better enable our students to explore and thrive in the future. Investing in these critical programs contributes to the future prosperity of America. For this reason, I'm incredibly grateful for the work each of you have done to support STEM programs in our country 
and I look forward to continuing to work with you and CEE in the future. Thanks again for letting me share a few words. An index of excellence in STEM education. And it's based on the combined outcomes of international bioelements in biology, chemistry, physics, math, and informatics. And just in 20, for the 2021 rating of all of these, the People's Republic of China has dominated each of these events for the last 30 years. Students from the USA have continued to perform well with either second or third place overall rankings for the last five years. The Russian Federation also has a strong performer, is in second place. Taiwan is in fourth place. And places five through 10 were captured by Singapore, Republic of Korea, Vietnam, Romania, Hong Kong, and Iran. So we really do have a competitive challenge that we have to keep fighting to be at the top. And uh, that is very much where Senator Young was very clear-eyed and focused about what we, what we need to do. So it's on the CEE.org website if you want to read more about that index. Uh, our board member, Mr. Pellegrino, has been uh, doing the analysis for each, each year. The next congressman on our honorary board is Representative Scott Peters. He's been representing the 50th District of California since he was elected in 2012 and serves on both the Budget and Energy and Commerce Committees, very powerful committees in the House. He holds a steadfast commitment to addressing issues involving our environment and climate change. His relevant legislation in that sphere includes the Ocean Pollution Reduction Act, the Hydrogen Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act, and the Prioritizing Clean Energy and Climate Cooperation with India Act. National Journal has ranked him the fourth most independent Democrat in Congress, thereby highlighting his bipartisan approach. Prior to Congress, he worked in environmental law, serving as an economist, for the EPA. He also served on the San Diego City Council and later was council president. And he was also appointed to both the Commission on Tax Policy in the New Economy and the California Coastal Commission. And he holds an undergraduate degree from Duke University. Hi everyone, I'm Congressman Scott Peters and thanks for including me in this event. I represent California's 50th district, which is home to internationally recognized innovation and technology. The work in my district drives much of my own work here in Washington, D.C., so I'm thrilled to be the center's honorary trustee. In today's world, it's impossible to deny the impact of science, technology, engineering, and math, from the phones we use and the cars we drive to the medical cures and engineering that keep our infrastructure from collapsing. It is literally and figuratively all around us. So when I'm back in home in San Diego, my work connects me to some of the most innovative companies in the country often speak with employees and experts during site visits and roundtable conversations to understand how their work can potentially change lives. Our progress as a country and as a society depends on the, work, on the work of institutions like the Center for Excellence in Education. I value how this organization supports high school and university students of all economic backgrounds to ensure future generations become some of the world's brightest leaders. The young people who benefit from CEE's mission are learning important skills in a fast-paced world during a critical time. It's important to think of the STEM fields in the context of our role in the world. And more than ever, the U.S. is competing with countries like China in technology and innovation. So that's why I voted to pass the Chips and Science Act, which was signed into law by President Biden last year. Among many provisions to lower costs and strengthen supply chains, the law authorized new and expanded investments in STEM education and training from K-12 to community college, undergraduate, and graduate education. The CHIPS and Science Act also includes provisions to drive opportunity and equity for all of America in STEM and innovation. Our work to strengthen education and careers in STEM is far from over, and I will keep working to lift up the importance of these fields for years to come. Thank you again for including me today, and I look forward to seeing all the great things that come out of this event. Good luck to you.
We have such an exciting speaker today for our program, Dr. Jonathan Gardner. Right on the heels of the SpaceX Starship rocket liftoff this past Thursday in its inaugural test flight, but which unfortunately did explode in midair. Dr. Jonathan Gardner is Deputy Senior Project Scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope, the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. He previously served as the Chief of the Laboratory for Observational Cosmology in the Astrophysics Science Division of NASA, Cis Goddard Space Flight Center. Dr. Gardner holds a bachelor's degree from Harvard University and a master's and PhD from the University of Hawaii. Following the latter, he was selected for an NSF NATO Research Fellowship completed at the University of Durham in the UK. He has been involved with studies involving the Hubble Ultra Deep Field and the Great Obs Observatory's Origins Deep Survey with work overall focusing on the universe and formation of galaxies. And maybe Dr. Gardner will be able to tell us what happened to SpaceX Starship 2. <laughs> so, Dr. Gardner, welcome. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, I'd like to actually add something to the introduction. I come from a family of educators. My father was a mathemat mathematics teacher, first in high school and then at the college level. My mother was the registrar of a theological seminary. And I'm very proud to say that my daughter is following in my father's footsteps. She graduates next month um, with a master's in education, and she's already lined up a job for the fall as a sixth grade math teacher. So I'm very proud that she She's meeting her calling uh, to be a middle school teacher. The James Webb Space Telescope is a joint project of NASA and the European and Canadian space agencies, but it's literally a product of our whole country. There are literally hundreds of companies in more than half of the state and thousands of people, scientists, engineers, managers, uh, secretaries, financial analysts, uh, who worked on the James Webb Space Telescope over the last 25 years. Uh, to get to to get to launch and to get to the point where we are getting the um, the scientific results. Uh, so I'll be telling you about about that. And but it all started with this picture. This is a picture taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Until last July, this was the faintest picture that humanity had ever taken. And when you look at this picture, you see stars, both, but mostly what you see are galaxies. And some of those galaxies are so far away that the light has been traveling most of the history of the universe, from the Big Bang to the present day, to get from where the light is emitted to um, our telescopes. And so when you look at um, some of these uh, very faintest, most distant galaxies in this picture. The light has been traveling for 13 billion years out of the 13.8 billion years of the history of the universe since the Big Bang. And one of the interesting things that happened when we looked at those galaxies in more detail is that some of them are already several hundred million years old, which means that if we wanted to find the first galaxies that formed after the Big Bang, we needed to go beyond the capabilities of Hubble. So that was what led to thinking about building a successor, the James Webb Space Telescope. And it differs from the Hubble Space Telescope in three very important ways. First of all, we have the size of the mirror. We need to look further, so we need a bigger telescope. We need a more collecting area to collect more light. And so the Webb is a six and a half meter diameter telescope compared to Hubble's 2.4 meters, which is just a little bit bigger than a person. Uh, but Webb is, is this, it would it would look um, it it would more than fill this room. So we needed a bigger telescope. 
uh, in order to, to see fainter things. But the other thing is that as the light is traveling from these very distant galaxies to, um, to our telescope, we, it, it goes through the universe as the universe is expanding. And the expanding universe stretches the wavelengths of the light. So that light that is emitted as visible light or in the ultraviolet is stretched out into the infrared, further red than we can see. And infrared light comes to us as heat radiation. And so we need a cold telescope. We need a telescope that is much colder than, than Hubble so that the telescope itself doesn't outshine what we're trying to see. So Hubble is kept at room temperature. It goes in and out of sunlight every 90 minutes as it goes around the Earth. And because we service Hubble, we sent astronauts up there, we didn't want them to freeze to the side of the telescope. So we actually keep it warm with heaters, keep it at room temperature. Webb, on the other hand, it will be allowed to cool. It's allowed to cool naturally to 218 degrees below zero Celsius. That's just 55 degrees above absolute zero. And parts of it are even colder. And we do that by putting it behind a five-layer tennis court-sized sun shield that protects the telescope from the sunlight and allows it to just send its heat out into deep space and cool down to these very uh, cold cryogenic temperatures. Another big difference is where we put it. So Hubble is in what's called low Earth orbit, uh, about um, 375 miles above the surface of the Earth. It goes around the Earth every 90 minutes, and uh, that's about as high as the space shuttle could fly to launch Hubble. <coughs> Webb, on the other hand, is in a special place there we go. Um, in a special place a million miles away. This is, this is called the second Lagrange point, and it is a point that goes around the Earth once per year as the Earth goes around the Sun once per year, thus keeping the Earth and the Sun and the telescope all in a line as, um, as the Earth goes around the Sun. And this allows both the Sun and the Earth to be behind this tennis court sized sun shield. So, um, I, I, I want you to get to the, the pictures, the science, um, so I'm not going to show you a lot of um, what happened during the construction, uh, but it was, it was very interesting engineering and it was great to see the telescope come together and go through testing. Um, a lot of that happened in the Goddard Space Flight Center clean room where I work. And they don't allow scientists to go into the clean room. That's, that's a job for the very highly trained technicians and engineers who are allowed to touch the flight hardware. But there was a time when the telescope's mirror was pointed at the viewing window. And I was able to take the coolest selfie I will ever take in my life <laughs> of myself reflected in the six and a half meter gold coated uh, web mirror. Um, but then we got the launch, which was Christmas Day 2021. And um, about half an hour after launch, uh, we were able to see the, um, the web telescope separate from the rocket. This is a camera that is in the upper stage of the launch vehicle. And um, Webb was separated, and this is our hot last high res resolution view we got of Webb as it went um, on its journey a million miles away to the second Lagrange point. Now you can see in the upper right that uh, the, the rocket and the telescope were already over the, co the east coast of Africa at this point. That's the Gulf of Aden up in the upper right. And one thing that was um, very exciting for those of us who had worked on it is that uh, we were able to see the deployment of the solar panels. Now, I, I want to say that in the control room, when, when launch happened, it looked like things were going well, you know, people clapped. But the real excitement came when we saw this solar panel deployed. Because we have done some rehearsals of the launch, and there was a rehearsal anomaly team that would introduce um, things going wrong for, in order for us to, to practice. And one time the rats uh, introduced um, the solar panel didn't deploy. 
And so we all knew that we had just seven hours of battery life to get that thing out and, um, and provide power to recharge the battery. Otherwise, we would have lost the mission. But it came out just 90 seconds after, um, after separation. And so the, the control room just kind of went wild at that point. We went through six months of commissioning with lots of deployments, unfolding the telescope, unfolding the sun shield. Uh, but um, then six months after launch, on July 11th last year, President Biden um, had a ceremony in the White House to bring out the first images of, of that Webb had taken. And these images, these first images are arranged in, uh, we arrange them in four science themes, but the science themes all speak to the goal of where did we come from, what are our origins, what was the first galaxy, stars and galaxies that formed after the Big Bang, how did those galaxies evolve over time from those first small pieces to present day large galaxies like our own Milky Way? How do stars and their planetary systems form within the Milky Way? And the study of planets around other stars, which we call exoplanets, and our own solar system, whether those planets might hold the conditions or the precursors for life on other planets. So those are the science themes, and we address those right out of the bat with the first um, images. And I'll sort of talk you through a few of those uh, science results. So first of all, um, last July, this by this became the faintest infrared picture that, of the universe that we had ever taken. And we've now broken that record twice since then. Uh, this is a, a cluster of galaxies, and the, the dark matter within the cluster acts as a lens, a gravitational lens, to allow us to look even still further. And I'm going to show you a spectrum, which is taking the light from one of these galaxies and breaking it up into its uh, individual wavelengths to show the constituents of what this galaxy is made of. And we can see heavier elements that were formed in stars of oxygen and neon uh, beyond the elements that came from the Big Bang. So this galaxy, the light has been traveling for 13.1 billion years, and we're, that means that we're not, because we have these heavier elements, which are second generation, they formed within the first generation of stars, um, this is not the first galaxy that formed in this region. We're still working on that. We're still doing deep fields and looking for even more distant galaxies. It's going to take us a little time. But uh, I would say as a scientist, when I saw this spectrum and saw the clarity with which we see these, the signatures of these elements, this told me we are going to be able to do what we built this telescope to do. It'll take some time. Scientists need to work on the data, and we, we uh, need to take more data, but we'll get there um, in the next few years. The process by which the first galaxies that formed um, evolved into present-day galaxies involves a lot of ga galaxy collisions. Galaxies merge together and build up over time through gravity. Now, when two galaxies collide, they don't go bang. They kind of go slosh because most of the space in a galaxy is empty space in between the stars. It's very rare for the stars themselves to collide. But what does collide is the gas in between the stars. And when clouds of gas collide, they create shocks and some of that gas and some of the dust in the gas will collapse down and form new stars. And this is something that Webb is very good at at finding, and you can see um, in the, the red band in between the two galaxies and kind of the upper right, um, that is a region where the gas is colliding and forming new stars and shines out in the infrared where, for Webb to see. So this is the process by which galaxies evolve over time. 
And within our own galaxy, we are also studying places where this is happening on a smaller scale, where stars are forming in their planetary systems. And there's a strong interaction between the stars that form and the, the next generation of stars. So um, the largest stars put out a lot of energy and blow bubbles, as you can see in this picture, blow bubbles uh, within the gas cloud. Uh, but the edges of those bubbles create, again, shocks that collapse the, the gas down to form new stars. Star formation is kind of a messy process. And here's another star forming region, one of our first images. And as we look in closer, in the lower right, you see that the yellow is a place where a new star is forming. But then in the upper right, there's a cloud of, of gas that has been injected from this system and um, sent off uh, well above the, the cloud. And there's also um, a very bright, very large star um, that's up off the field of view that is creating this shock front that you can see um, about midway through the picture. So we're starting to uh, <clears throat> starting to understand the, um, the formation of stars and because these clouds have dust, which is what you see in the, in the brown, that dust collapses down to form planets. We are also studying planets around other stars, what we call exoplanets, um, and there's a very powerful technique when we have a chance alignment and the planet goes in front of the actual face of the star. When that happens, we call it a transit, and light from the star will pass through the atmosphere of that planet and on our way to the to the on its way to our telescope, and we can analyze that that light and see the constituents of the atmospheres of other planets. Um, this is something that uh, is was only started within about the last 20 years. And Webb was able to make the first detection of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere of another planet. Now we've not yet got to the point where we're able to, where we have detected the atmosphere of a small rocky planet like the Earth, but we're on our way. We have made the first attempt at finding an atmosphere, and the planet we were looking at didn't have one. So um, we're going on to some other potential targets, but what we're, what we're the, one of the big goals is to study the atmospheres of Earth-like planets and look for um, organic molecules and uh, weather and water vapor and whether um, the planet might be conducive to uh, life on um, life on other planets. And then in our own solar system, um, Webb can't point towards the sun, so we can't look at the uh, Mercury, Venus, or the Earth, but we can look at everything else, and we have. Um, so we've got pictures of Jupiter, uh, you see Neptune, and you can see the ring of Neptune, which is, um, turns out that Webb is very good at detecting rings. Uh, we supported the DART mission, the impact of a spacecraft onto an asteroid, and you can see in the um, the, the video of, of the ejecta coming out of that um, asteroid. Lower left we have um, Saturn's moon Titan, and then um, in the lower right some studies of Mars and the, the surface of, of Mars. This is a picture that was released very recently of the planet Uranus, and um, I don't know if you can read the, um, the labels, but we have the Shakespearean moons of Uranus, Ariel, Miranda, um, Puck. Uh, but when we look close up in this picture, we see the very beautiful detection of the wings of Uranus, and the, the sort of diamond shining in the um, at about nine o'clock is the pole. Um, Uranus is a planet that's been knocked on to its side, and so the pole is, um, is at a different um, orientation than, than the rest of our solar system. So um, we saw last July, and continuing um, on since then, the public has been very, very interested in the results from Webb. When, uh, when we had our first pictures, 
come out, we were on the front page of the New York Times and the Washington Post, both cases two days in a row. Um, one, one person commented that um, astronomy is the only good news that gets above the fold on the front page of these newspapers. Um, we're happy to supply that, uh, supply some good news. Um, the pictures were shown in Times Square, Piccadilly Circus, um, and bands picked them up, popular culture. So we've got Coldplay in the lower right, and um, our project manager, Mel Oaks, was a huge Jimmy Buffett fan, so he was very happy to see that Jimmy Buffett picked up the pictures as well. Um, we got the Google Doodle one day, and it's still possible to go to the post office and buy your Webb Space Telescope stamps, so you can show your support for NASA and for astronomy every time you pay a bill. <laughs> if you'd like to follow further developments, um, we often just get picked up by the news, but we of course have a website, web.nasa.gov, where we have all of our um, news features. We have a blog, um, blogs.nasa.gov slash web, where we go a little bit more in depth into some of our results. Um, and of course, you can follow us on social media, uh, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and so forth. So I would be happy to take any questions if you have questions. Yes? Right, so um, NASA does have a, a next generation telescope in the works. It's called the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. Nancy Roman was um, considered kind of the mother of the Hubble Space Telescope. She worked at NASA headquarters. Um, but the Roman Space Telescope is actually not larger than Webb. It's going in a different direction. It's the size of Hubble with a hundred times the, the field of view. So we can take pic large pictures of the sky and scan large amounts of the sky. So Hubble and Webb both focus in um, small fields of view but going very, very deep, very faint. Uh, the Roman telescope will cover large areas and look for rare objects. And it's also uh, designed to um, learn about the history of the expansion of the universe, which is being driven by a mysterious force called dark energy. That's a, that's a pressure that pushes on the expansion of the universe and actually speeds it up uh, against the force of gravity, which is slowing down the expansion of the universe. So Roman is scheduled to launch in 2027. It's um, well on its way to being built. And then the next after that is um, something we could, we, we've just recently named the Habitable Worlds Observatory. Uh, every 10 years, the National Academy of Sciences gives recommendations to the US government on what NASA and NSF and the Department of Energy should be doing in science, in astronomy and astrophysics. And they recommended that um, the, the next big telescope to come after Roman would be a telescope the size of Webb, so six to seven meters in diameter, but optimized to study Earth-like planets and in particular to look for what we call biomarkers. So Webb is going to be able to study um, small rocky planets and see whether they might hold the conditions for life. Is it the right temperature to have liquid water? Are there um, constituents in the atmosphere that would look like they could be supportive of life? But actually finding life on other planets is a harder job. And so the, the next big telescope after Roman in the late 2030s um, is going to be optimized to actually look for the evidence that a planet around another star might have life. And we're not talking about intelligent life, we're talking about plants and animals that um, would, would change the atmosphere the way um, the atmosphere on the Earth is, is uh, regulated by the presence of life on Earth. So that's, that's the future, it's very exciting. Yes?
which is said James Webb gets hit by a comet or meteor or something. Um, what are you all's plans with respect to the repairing of the device uh, in particular? Um, and then when you're looking at the pictures that are taken, uh, who analyzes that and when will that do you all put a report out of the analysis of that or that is on the blog? How does that work? Okay, two good questions. The first one was what are our plans for fixing it if something goes wrong for astronomers? Um, people around the country uh, write their, down their best ideas of what the web should look at and um, then it goes to a peer review. And we're actually, as we speak, we're in the process of running that peer review for the second year of observations. Uh, we got 1,600 proposals for um, eight years of data, and we're gonna, this peer review is meeting now um, and picking just the very best of those proposals because we're gonna allocate one year to um, the very best projects. Um, and then, so, um, then that gets put onto the schedule. We, we uh, when the data are taken, they get um, uh, put into the um, Senator Mikulski archive at Johns Hopkins University. It's named after Senator Mikulski because she was such a big supporter of Hubble and Webb. Um, and then the scientists will get the data. They analyze it on their computer, working with their um, graduate students and um, other researchers. And they write scientific papers that go um, to the journals. And the journals will then do a peer review, make sure that, um, that it, was, uh, it was good research, and we'll publish it. As part of that process, um, if uh, it looks like something's going to be of interest to the public, um, then uh, we also, our outreach team, will um, work on sort of simultaneously with the, with the peer review and publication process. We'll um, put together the press release and the images that are then released to the public. Um, so that's how we get the scientific results. Um, most, uh, everything gets written up in the journals, often multiple papers. Um, the data sets are so rich, they've got so many results in them that, um, that uh, the team, the sometimes very large teams will, um, will write many papers. And um, uh, then also, the data is still in the archive, and sometimes even years later, scientists can have another idea of what the same picture could tell them, and we'll do another study and just get the data out of the archive. So um, the Hubble Space Telescope, which has been in orbit, it just had its 33rd birthday um, just last week, 33 years since launch. Um, the, the archive is just full of 30, 33 years of data, and there are actually more scientific papers being written on archival data with Hubble that are being written on new observations. Um, and uh, with Webb, you know, we, we hope to have um, a, a very long lifetime and, and a very full archive, and people will continue to, uh, to think of new ways of analyzing the data uh, in the future. Yes. Good afternoon, Dr. Gardner. I'm with the Embassy of Switzerland. So like many other nations, Switzerland participated in the development of the James Webb Space Telescope with a mirroring and framing instrument. So can you tell us more about the international scientific cooperation for uh, such a telescope? Sure, yes. Um, yeah, we appreciate uh, your country's contribution. Um, so WEB is, a, is an international project. It's a joint project of NASA, the European and Canadian Space Agency. So Switzerland participated um, through the ESA, through the European Space Agency. In all, there were 12 European countries that contributed hardware to the mission, and then all, I believe, 22 countries contributed um, uh, resources to the mission through ESA. Um, the, um, the European contribution um, consisted of uh, one of our four cameras, the near infrared spectrograph. So when I showed you the spectra, um, in, in a couple of pictures that was taken by the European instrument 
Um, but also, um, our another instrument was a joint project of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in the United States and a consortium of European countries that were managed by ESA, um, where each of the national uh, agencies and national space agencies in Europe contributed pieces to the mid-infrared instrument. Um, and uh, so that, that's very important. Um, NASA was the lead on this, um, the, the major partner, uh, but we also, um, NASA and ESA and um, the CSA, the Canadian Space Agency, as well as other countries like JAXA and Japan, we do partner on these big science projects, on these, these science missions. Um, it's usually good to have one agency leading it and the other agencies contributing um, contributing hardware. It's usually done on a no exchange of funds basis, so we work out in the negotiation phase which country is going to do what, and then that country is responsible for delivering that, that piece. Um, but it, it has the advantage of um, uh, enhancing the, the international cooperation in science, um, builds up our uh, science and technology industries in um, both countries, in, our, in our, uh, the United States and our allies, and um, just generally, it's, a, it's kind of a good thing to do because you get the intellectual benefit of, um, of the, the partnership, of the strengths of each different country. Uh, for each of your missions. Um, so future missions, um, like I mentioned, the Habitable Worlds Observatory, we haven't formed the partnerships yet, but um, NASA headquarters is uh, getting going on doing those negotiations and figuring out what sort of partnership we're going to put together. So this is, a, this is an important part of the way big science is done today. Um, it's, it's a product of the world and it's a benefit How long does it take to send down a picture? Um, we use the Deep Space Network um, and we communicate uh, with the observatory um, daily. Um, so we uh, will, we have an onboard um, recorder storage that can store um, about two days worth of data and we send it down every day. That provides um, the ability to have a missed transmission. Um, in case of, of you know, bad weather at the, at the ground station. The, the Deep Space Network has three um, radio telescopes around the world in Australia, uh, California, and um, um, Spain. And um, so we, uh, we continuously use the observatory to take new data. It goes into the, the solid state recorder on board. And then when we're in communication, um, we're downloading the data uh, using radio transmissions. Um, it's uh, something like 200-something um, gigabytes a day, which is, doesn't seem like a whole lot, but um, it's going a long ways.
With a career largely defined by bipartisanship, she was rated one of the most bipartisan freshman members during the 115th Congress. She served as a member of the Problem Solvers Caucus and launched the Bipartisan Comprehensive Care Caucus. On National STEM Day in November of 2021, Senator Rosen and Senator Morgado launched the Senate's first Women in STEM Caucus to bring focus and attention to women's underrepresentation in that sector. In 2019, Senator Rosen authored and Senator Moore Capito sponsored the Building Blocks of STEM Act, which was signed into law. Her work includes service on the Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee, Senate Armed Services, and the Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee, of which she serves as chair of the subcommittee on tourism, trade, and export promotion. Her legislative priorities involve women empowerment, national security, and our veterans, with sponsored legislation including the VA Zero Suicide Demonstration Project Act and the Veteran Education Empowerment Act. She holds an associate's from Clark County Community College and a BA from the University of Minnesota, Minneapolis, and began her career in computer programming and software development. She is a coder, okay? <laughs> and, uh, so without further ado, and again, you didn't get to hear this in the room, but I thank your staff, Maggie and your entire staff, for just phenomenal. Yes. There they are. <laughs> I'm a coder. I tell my team all the time, I said, you're never going to take the systems analyst out of me. That's for sure. You may, you know, you take that out of the woman. But uh, hello, everyone. I am so glad to see all of you, Senator. So nice to see you. Uh, and it's just a great day to be here. Uh, thank, Lou, thank you, Clarine, for that wonderful introduction. And I also want to thank um, the Center for Excellence in Education and President Joanne De Gennaro for your work, for your support of students to help them succeed, to empower them to realize and reach their full potential. Because the work that you do to promote education, to nurture those careers in science, technology, engineering, and math, like I was as a young woman, is critical in shaping the next generation of scientists, engineers, inventors, innovators, and dare I say, our future leaders. And so across the country, we're seeing a huge demand for people with education and experience in STEM fields. And we know this, the demand is only going up. Software developers, mathematicians, healthcare aides, they're among some of the fastest growing occupations in the country. And despite, despite these growing opportunities, Students all over the country still face barriers to access for STEM education. They face barriers to get the training necessary to fill these expanding fields. And the skills that we know are necessary to compete in a 21st century economy. So organizations like CEE, you all, you're stepping up to the challenge of providing thousands of students with access to math, science, technological education. Couldn't be more important because you are helping to close the skills gap and build a workforce that's gonna drive innovation for years to come. And I'm proud to say that several events have been recognized by CEE over the past few years. And I am also grateful to be here today as an honorary board member myself. Um, I will say, um, promoting some opportunities in STEM, STEM education uh, deeply personal to me. And that young programmer that got her first job, well, that started coding on, in the 70s on card decks, when you had to put all the, every, I see, depending on your age, you're laughing. Some, age, some ages you saw it, only see it in a museum. But um, <laughs> that's how we started. I started my career in the 1980s. Um, Boy, I couldn't have imagined that I'd be standing here today, an honorary board member promoting all of this. 
it's amazing that you're still having, still doing this in the depth that you're doing it. Because like I said, before I came here, I did build my career as a computer programmer and a systems analyst. And that experience that I brought with me here to Congress to break down barriers, to increase representation for future generations of girls and women who want to work or learn STEM for whatever they want to do. As you mentioned, it's why I introduced the Building Blocks of STEM Act, which I'm proud to say was the very first piece of legislation I got signed into law. Pretty fitting, right? And I'm very excited about that. It was a few years ago, and this bipartisan law expands STEM education initiatives <laughs> at the National Science Foundation for young children. And it helps encourage, encourage increased participation for girls in computer science. Young girls like was maybe not so long ago. <laughs> Longer than I think, but uh, not so long ago. But it did also help uh, to launch, and I'm the co-chair of the Women in STEM Caucus, and we're a group of bipartisan senators working to increase the numbers of women in science, technology, engineering, and math, not just in education, but in choosing these careers. And most recently, I helped pass a historic Chips and Science Act, which includes several of my provisions. I don't have to tell you about the whole bill, but um, some of my provisions were to break down barriers in rural STEM education because we need young people to come from every corner of our country. We need to support that workforce development and training, again, because people need to know that these jobs are out there and what's the pathway to get there, and really increase participation of women in underrepresented communities in STEM, because that is going to make us all stronger. And so these are just some of the ways that I'm working in Congress to help support programs like CEE. Because if we're going to lead the world in creating an economy of the future, we must, it's incumbent upon all of us to create opportunities for our students to reach their full potential. And it starts with really making sure that education is accessible to all. And so I want to thank you again for investing in our children and in the future generations of scientists, engineers, former coders like myself and, and leaders. You're all our leaders here on this. Because I believe, like all of you, that our children, all of our children, must be educated to, to learn, to know how to think, to dream, to imagine. This is where that innovation comes from. This is where the desire to create, when you have that love of education and of learning and the surprise and, and the research, all of those things that a great education gives you. Because they're going to need to take on the challenges of the rest of the century and beyond. And it's our responsibility to give them the tools that they need to succeed and put them on that path forward. Nothing could be more important for our future and our children's future. So I just want to thank you all again for being here. I want to thank you for all that you do. I know that you know you have a partner in the Senate. I'm going to keep working on all of these things. And uh, I want there to be one day when um, maybe we reach some parity with women in STEM and, uh, <laughs> and do all of that. So thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you for all you do. Appreciate it.
So when our history books are finally written, I strongly believe that his record will reveal that he is one of the most consequential figures of the century. Consequential in the sense that an overwhelming number of public policy debates, excuse me, or matters in the Senate over his 24 years, history will show that he played a uniquely strategic and pivotal role, sometimes advocating an independent and courageous position that was only later adopted by others. And the senator was consequential in his personal approach, too, as a public servant and leader, always choosing to engage in problem solving as opposed to finger pointing, and knowing that to secure a successful solution, he needed to work and develop trust with his colleagues across the aisle. And last, and definitely not least, I know he admires Admiral Rickover and Joanne De Janeiro for having the foresight to establish CEE almost 40 years ago, and he's a strong advocate of CEE and its clear-eyed mission for the students and our country's future. So now, before I introduce Dr. Aaron Kesselheim to the audience, I'd like to ask Senator Lieberman to join me at the podium. Uh, one of the great honors I received 
Uh, after I left the Senate, was to have this award named for me. Um, it, it, to me, it's a sort of a legacy item. I will tell you that, the, the, unfortunately, there have been a few others since, but the only legacy uh, item I had before that was in my hometown of Stanford, Connecticut, a restaurant uh, called 613, named a, a very big deli sandwich, the Joe Lieberman. <laughs> Uh, you know, tastier than the Lieberman Award, but not as, not as substantive and ultimately good uh, for your health. Um, I was drafted into involvement at CEE by former Senator Sam Nunn, who was a colleague, a friend, and really a mentor to me. And when he, uh, he was the honorary trustee of CEE in the Senate for quite a while, and when he left the Senate, at leaving, called me and said, I got something I want you to do, and, and I know you, you, you're going to say, oh, another thing, but you're going to like this, and it was to become his successor as honorary trustee, and honestly, it's one of the best things I did in my uh, 24 years uh, in the Senate because of getting to know um, Joanne and the vision that Admiral Rickover had. Incidentally, Dr. Gardner. When it came my time to leave the Senate, I turned the honorary trustee torch over to a guy named Bill Nelson, mm -hmm. senator from Florida, now the head of NASA. I thought your, your presentation was thrilling, really. And uh, I was just grateful that I could understand it uh, because I went to a, a, the old days, we had liberal arts colleges. They tried to prepare you in all subjects of civilization. And, uh, but they were good enough to have a, a track of science for non-science majors like myself. And uh, I took the track in geology and astronomy. Uh, and uh, which we called rocks and stars. <laughs> <laughs> and my, uh, I'm, I'm digressing, but it, it's taking me back. Uh, the professor of astronomy, I'm sorry, geology, was a man named Richard Flint, who we naturally called, uh, well, students did, not to his face, Rocky Flint. So <laughs> enough, enough of that. But I tell you, what a, what a thrilling uh, report you gave and how lucky we are that people like you have devoted their lives to expanding uh, human uh, knowledge. You know, in, in uh, coming back to this event, I decided it was also time for me to go back and remind myself of the extraordinary life of Admiral Hyman Rickover, who with Joanne and Gennaro uh, really created CEE. And I, I urge you to do that sometime. Uh, when you read one of the many excellent biographies, or just uh, go on Wikipedia. Um, and Admiral Rickover was born in Poland, and his family emigrated. This is a time, I'm saying this now at a time when uh, not everybody in America seems to embrace immigration and immigrants. But uh, Admiral uh, Rickover's family left Poland. Uh, because they were uh, subject to anti-Semitism uh, and, and came to America, stopped for a short while in the Lower East Side, which was the place where a lot of immigrants did, and then moved to Chicago. Um, his father was a tailor. He worked uh, very hard, uh, uh, had really labor jobs, and uh, was working at them, and then somehow came to the attention of his uh, congressman, who was also an immigrant, and um, the congressman uh, nominated him for the U.S. Naval Academy, which was one of the best things that anybody ever did for the United States of America. Uh, Hyman Rickover excelled at the Naval Academy. He went in on to serve in the Navy for 63 years. At the time he, he uh, ended that service, it was the longest uh, anybody had ever served in the Navy. I don't know if it still is, Joanne, or not. And uh, of course he became, without uh, spending too much on this, the father of the nuclear Navy, 
which um, has uh, played such a role, not only in the advancement of science and knowledge with applications beyond the nuclear navy, but in protecting the security and uh, freedom of the people of America, and still do. He was a, he was a patriot, uh, he was an innovator, uh, he was a, a visionary, he was an extraordinary, and as uh, Joanne suggested earlier, tough administrator. Um, and you know, his interviews of people trying to get into the submarine program are legendary. But in the, in the vernacular of today, I, I suppose you could say he was a bully. But, not, uh, but he was a bully in the sense that he was trying to get the best out of uh, everybody who came before him. As he gave the best of himself, he lived a life of excellence. A theme that, that I found again through his uh, biography, uh, his belief that he expressed in articles and books about the critical importance of constantly improving uh, the education America was giving its children for the benefit of not only them and their right to a, a, a life of equal opportunity, every one of them, uh, but for the country, for, for the role that um, uh, the students who were educated well would play uh, in our economy and, of course, uh, as the head of the nuclear navy in uh, our national defense. Uh, it, it's something to go back and look at. And, I, and toward the end of his life, together with Joanne, with whom he had worked, he formed the Center for Excellence in Education and began uh, RSI. And it has, uh, talk about legacies, it has continued the, the legacy of, uh, uh, for him through the remarkable students who come out of the program and uh, go on to the kind of life of leadership and service that Dr. Uh, Kessel, I'm uh, the award winner today, that uh, represents. Uh, it's, it's quite a story uh, and one that I'm, I can't tell you how grateful and proud I am to have um, my name associated with. Uh, Clarine uh, talked about Dr. Kesselheim's record. I love the fact that he was not satisfied with being a doctor, but he became a lawyer. I greatly enhanced the reputation of the profession that I have been part of <laughs> for decades. Not, uh, and which sometimes needs that enhancing, but his work has been, uh, been so consequential, he's been so productive, and, and th this award, as you know, goes uh, to people who, uh, who were graduates of, of the RSA program, and um, the, uh, the CEE programs, to basically honor them, but to remind ourselves uh, and all of you who are here, who are good enough to support CEE, uh, what happens to these gifted students who go through the CEE programs and go on uh, to do extraordinary work uh, for um, our country and really indeed uh, for the world. Uh, Admiral Rickover believed particularly in the value of STEM education uh, that's what CE is all about, and was what is reflected in extraordinary ways um, in Dr. Kesselheim's uh, career thus far. He's a young man; he's got a lot more he will do ahead. Incidentally, um, uh, we don't claim total credit in CE and RSI for his accomplishments uh, in his uh, life thus far. I, I would have to give a thank you to his parents for. As I think you, you you contributed not only good genetic material, <laughs> trying to stay within the STEM orbit, but uh, you undoubtedly gave him the motivation, uh, along with his brother, that is reflected in his work. So, uh, Dr. Kesselheim, thank you, and I'm honored to call you up to present the award to you.
Thanks, everybody. So um, he asked me to say a few words about my participation in RSI, my career path, uh, and my service to medical policy. And since I do everything this indeed tells me, uh, I'm going to do that. Uh, but thank you very much for this honor. Um, it's really meaningful to be recognized by the Center for Excellence in Education since RSI was such a foundational experience uh, in my career. When I did RSI back in 1991, it was held at George Washington University. Um, I had a great summer. I took the metro out to the National Cancer Institute every day to uh, research an enzyme related to cancer metastases um, that was used in diagnosis of cancer metastases. And then in the evenings, um, we would share our ideas and our roadblocks uh, with each other, hear lectures from various eminent scientists, uh, pull all-nighters to watch the sunrise from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, uh, hack into the shockingly poorly protected main GW computer system <laughs> and send out email about this new thing back in 1991 from the Queen's office to various people uh, and for reasons lost in history, discharge the fire extinguishers into the elevator shafts. Um, RSI moved to Boston the next year uh, <laughs> and asked Mrs. Steve maybe why I did that. Um, I learned a lot at RSI, and not just about federal laws regarding tampering with fire equipment. Um, I learned that there was a community out there of really accomplished people who were committed to doing great things. Um, at home, the smartest person I knew was my brother. Uh, but at RSI, there were kids like him who came from all corners of the world and all different backgrounds. And listening to the amazing presentations at the end of the summer showed me that if you can create communities dedicated to supporting people's talents, you can get impressive and important results. So after RSI, I started pursuing my goal to become a doctor like my dad. Um, but it, would, it was also around the time when the Clinton health care plan was going down in flames. And I got interested in the political and legal issues uh, affecting how patients received care um, and, and that were beyond the reach of individual doctors. So I thought maybe about doing a law degree. Um, and I think it was uh, my Jewish mother who said, well, why not do both? Uh, so, uh, with the goal to get involved with health policy, uh, I applied to get a law degree in addition to med medical training. During that time, I, drew, I grew fascinated by prescription drugs, which are one of the most common and effective medical interventions we have, and how the laws and regulations affect their development and use. And in particular, I was concerned by the excessively high prices uh, that made essential prescription drugs out of reach of my patients and the patent games that drug companies played to prevent timely competition from generics. And I saw how my patients' health suffered because they couldn't afford their medications, um, and some of them suffered severe economic hardship as well. Um, so after my residency, um, with support from my wife Jennifer and help from my mentor Jerry Aborn, I founded Portal, the Program of Regulation, Therapies, and Law, to focus on these issues. And one of my goals was to build a center where people could come together with different backgrounds and types of expertise to conduct research that would make a difference um, in people's lives by identifying key factors involved in transformative drug development uh, or supporting policies to try to ensure that essential medicines were available to whoever needed them. And I think at some level, maybe I was trying to create another RSI, uh, except without those perennially foggy elevators that always seem to be there. Um, in the last decade, uh, with continued support from Mrs. D in the center, every time I call them with a question, they're always so, so um, you know, willing to help, to help me out and connect me with other uh, Rickoids and, and, and students. Uh, our stuff, um, so Portal has been very successful. We've obtained millions of dollars of government and foundation grants while assiduously avoiding any financial entanglements with the pharmaceutical industry that might cause a conflict of interest. Grounded by our dedication to improve patient outcomes, uh, equity and affordability and to promote meaningful innovation. Uh, Portal has become a leaded and trusted source of, of rigorous research and evidence-based policy proposals. We've even generated what we call PPVs, or Portal Policy Victories. Um, the biggest one being the Inflation Reduction Act, um, the, the um, most consequential piece of legislation affecting the availability of prescription drugs to U.S. patients in the last 20 years, which built on ideas coming from Portal about how to negotiate drug prices and reform the way patients pay for their medications in Medicare. The IRA is just one example of Portal's work. Um, 
and how Portal's work in congressional testimony and extensive outreach to policymakers has helped change the prescription drug market uh, in ways that will promote innovation, access, and affordability of drugs for years to come. Uh, recently, I even got the chance to channel Admiral Rickover, um, who, who we learned at RSI stuck to his principles um, and was quick to call out uh, malarkey uh, when he saw it. And so uh, that happened when I was a member of an FDA advisory committee that voted nearly unanimously against an Alzheimer's drug called aducanumab that showed no clear patient benefit, dangerous side effects that could have cost Medicare tens of billions of dollars a year, but was nevertheless given a accelerator approval by the FDA. So I resigned in protest from that committee and then contributed to the pushback against the drug um, that many providers and insurers that helped make, allow many providers and insurers to make the unexpected decision not to offer it and CMS to issue a nearly unprecedented restrictive national coverage determination and nowadays the drug is hardly used at all. And that's a good thing because people with Alzheimer's disease deserve medications that work, not false hope that could put them at risk and bankrupt them and the healthcare system. So since RSI has had such an immense impact on me and my career, a few years ago, I started working with CEE to assign current Rickoids to do their summer research at my center. Rickoids like Sharif, who is, uh, who is sitting over there in the, in the corner. Um, uh, every year I am more astounded than the last at the level of talent that these Rickoids possess, and it is uh, just incredibly impressive to be part of this, to be part of this community and to be able to give back to the next generation of, of Rickoids. So I want to thank CEE. This is Dee, uh, Maite in particular, uh, for, for setting me off on this journey and for creating a program that has inspired so many to try to achieve excellence uh, and to make a difference in the world. Um, this is really one of the most important programs in the American educational system, and it's an honor and a pleasure for me to be a part of it. So thank you all very much. every one of you for participating in this special program today. If you have any questions or anything about the center, please don't hesitate to reach out to Joanne Nell or me or any of the staff um, because we do depend on personal donations to help our center stay vibrant for the future. There's so many new participants here today um, that are Learning, learning more about us too. So, Joanne, anything else? Uh, yeah, we're running right on schedule because Clement is like, oh. <laughs> 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 and God bless her. She really works so hard for us and with us. And to Senator Joe Lieberman, all these years has been great. Thank you so much. I want you to consider getting more involved with us. Even some of the alums that are here could do better. <laughs> <laughs> and, and do uh, each year in your philanthropy. Think of CE with a little donation or a big donation. We appreciate everything because our programs remain the only ones in this country, free of cost, long term through undergraduate, graduate school, and then we follow your life with our alumni databases, our alum website, um, the person who coordinates this for us. Um, to our alums, I always say, we're with you for life, whether you like it or not. <laughs> so uh, with that, God bless you. Thank you for being here today. <clears throat> I hope to see you next year. And to Aaron, uh, we would hope that others would emulate his accomplishments because they are great. They came with great work. Uh, many people say, oh, they're brilliant. They don't have to work. No. You all work hard when you're through, when you go through the Research Science Institute and keep fighting for leadership in the STEM field. So we are so honored to present this award through Senator Lieberman to Aaron Kesselheim.
model to students in STEM throughout the world. Thank you to our ambassadors that are here, to the international community, because we believe that through education, we have soft power from this country to effectuate better relations between and among nations. So thank you all, and thank you for helping us. Have a lovely afternoon. Look at the time, Corinne, you did it. <laughs>